Love, Hate, and Propaganda, a six-part series with George Strombolopoulos, 70 years later, why World War II still matters. What happens when an ally becomes an enemy? Imagine this, you wake up one day and you find that something has changed, and a country that was once on your side has suddenly turned against you. That's the story of a young Russian woman in 1941. One day, she had a regular life. The next, she was pointing a gun at German soldiers, her heart filled with hatred. World War II was a time of passion and fury, with propaganda inspiring pride, demonizing the enemy. And it wasn't just in Russia and Germany. The Americans, the Japanese, in 1941, it seems everyone had a new enemy. Summer 1940, Hitler's army steamrolls its way across Europe. Next stop, that little island called Great Britain. The United States is still on the sidelines, refusing to get involved, which is good for Hitler because he wants nothing less than total control of Europe. So far, it's going pretty well for Hitler, and there's no obvious reason that he can't pull it off. Can anything or anyone stop the Nazis? The Brits know they're next on Hitler's hit list, so they prepare for the worst. Londoners gave no thought to evacuating the city themselves, but they moved most of the children to safer areas in the country. It's a given that initial attacks will come from German bombers, so air raid shelters spring up everywhere. Gas masks are distributed. Everyone wants to do something while waiting for the inevitable attack. And when they're asked to join the war effort, civilians sign up. Many as volunteer firefighters in the auxiliary fire service. More from overseas as new troops arrive from Canada. More than 100,000 Canadian soldiers would come. One of them is accompanied by his wife, Yvonne Green, is a 29-year-old Montrealer determined to do whatever it takes to stop Hitler. Maman chérie, it doesn't feel like war yet, but the people know it is coming. Yvonne Green came from a very wealthy family in Montreal. When Yvonne first volunteered, it was 1940, and this was a very dangerous year for people in Britain and people in the Commonwealth, because now Britain stood alone. As they say, the devil is in the details, and Hitler leaves nothing to chance. He oversees everything. His plan, before attempting a land invasion, he wants to bomb British industrial, military, and civilian centers. My blood is up and I'm dying to take a poke at the Germans. Don't believe people who say British morale is low. We're just spoiling for a fight. The reason Brits are feeling gung-ho is because there's a new man at the helm. Make no mistake, you don't want to mess with Winston Churchill. We can stand up to him. All Europe may be free. Life of the world may move forward. forward. So how do you explain Churchill? Stubborn, rude, he growled when he talked and scowled at those he disliked. Yet in time of war, he stirred his people to greatness. If the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their final power. Churchill is one of those politicians who really understands communication. He knew the words to use. He knew how to connect to people's imaginations. And I think he played a vital role in holding the country together. The 
in dozens of flights, hundreds of planes. So where are Britain's fighting forces? The RAF is already doing battle in the skies. The British Army can't do much of anything except wait for air attacks or an invasion. In the beginning, Germans attack military and industrial installations, but as time goes by, bombs get closer and closer to the big cities. September 7th, they hit London. The blitz begins. German planes rain down death, destruction, and devastation. By this time, Yvonne Green is a volunteer with the fire brigade. She gets her first taste of war up close. Blitzkrieg on London started on Saturday last. I must say, it shook me up a bit. Mrs. Richard and I were taking cover in the basement. When the bombing stops, Yvonne Green is out there, scouring the streets, looking for unexploded incendiary bombs. Nerves are frayed, and emotions are raw. One starts up with a feeling of black hate turned into complete exasperation. And I wish I could get at the Germans and tear them as painfully as possible into little bits. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. One of the great attributes of Churchill was his certainty. So he could inspire confidence, raise morale, and convince the people that if they stayed with him, then there would be ultimate victory. The British spirit never breaks. Between air raids, people just go about their daily business. The Second World War has been called the People's War because they had such a desire to participate and also because so much was asked of them during this war. For the British people in wartime, it became a, a sort of a badge of self-esteem and almost a mark of their own identity to resist the bombardment and to rally round. And people today in Britain still talk about the Blitz spirit. Of course, Churchill knows that a stiff upper lip is no match for German bombs. So what do the British do? Well, after inspiring his own people to resist, Churchill turns his attention to the Americans. So he comes up with a radical plan. This is London, 1940. This film will try to show you what happened to London during the autumn and winter of that He year. invites American correspondents to come and experience the war firsthand. I'm speaking from London. Churchill lifts censorship and even allows live broadcast of attacks against London. I'm looking out over these house tops. Overnight, a young American radio newsman becomes a celebrity. Edward R. Murrow, who had arrived in London in the mid-30s, is determined to get America to join the fight. I'm standing on a rooftop, looking out over London. The plane is still very high, and it's quite clear that he's not coming in for his bombing run. Earlier this evening, we could hear a day late, a 
again, those were explosions overhead. It's an amazing propaganda coup that the British are able to uh, develop this special relationship with the American correspondents. Just overhead now, the burst of the anti-aircraft fire. There they are, that hard, stony sound. To be able to speak with the American public and to bring the sounds of war into America's uh, living rooms really brought the war alive and I think changed American public opinion. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Churchill was partly American and he understood the American mentality. He also knew how to use various aspects in British culture which would appeal to the American people. But there are values which were shared on both sides of the Atlantic. And these values would include liberty, they would include freedom, the right of individuals to voice dissent. Churchill's radical plan works. It's clear what he expects of the Americans because this man doesn't mince words. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. In January 1941, the Americans give up neutrality. They start sending weapons and supplies to Britain. Canada will help in transporting some of that equipment by sea and by air. With help on the way, there's reason for Londoners to hope. In the meantime, the bombs keep dropping. Yvonne Green is now doing the dangerous job of fire watcher. She is stationed during air raids on building rooftops. For Yvonne Green, her choice to volunteer was in many ways on the front line of the war effort of the Allies. But in letters to her mother, she rarely mentions the danger of the job. I was as high up as one can get in Chelsea Old Church Tower. The bombs dropped. I tell you, I never descended a flight of spiral staircases so fast in all my life. So now Hitler is really getting impatient. He's been bombing London for 57 days and nothing. So what now? He calls the whole thing off. The skies are silent. The bombs eventually cease. For the British, this battle is won. But for many, the victory is bittersweet. Thousands have perished, including the brave young volunteer from Montreal, Yvonne Green. June 22nd, 1941. Early morning. First German tanks are rolling through small villages and farmers' fields. Hitler is on the move again. This time, he's heading east, smashing his way through Russia. Strange thing this, because Stalin and Hitler had signed a peace deal two years before. But now Hitler has decided the Russians aren't allies anymore, they're the enemy. When Stalin is told of the invasion, he's so shocked he disappears for several days. When Russians get the news on the radio, they hear the voice of Foreign Affairs Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. <laughs> For 
were young or old, the order was fight or work. Ludmila Pavlichenko wants to fight. The 24-year-old history student is among the first to volunteer. Together with hundreds of thousands of her comrades, she wants to play her part in stopping the German onslaught. Everything was boiling hot inside of me. It was so vile to attack us. Ludmilla, who started shooting as a hobby, is an accomplished marksman. So she's assigned to sniper duty in Odessa. I have to admit, I was scared in my first real baptism of fire. But soon I learned the steadiness and coolness required to be a sniper. Hitler calls this massive invasion Operation Barbarossa. It's his most ambitious military campaign so far. If successful, he'll have total control of the precious resources in the vast Russian territory. Careful of the image they want to project, Hitler and his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, document the invasion, but hold back all images until they are certain they are winning. When they do release the carefully packaged newsreels two weeks later, the timing is perfect. Auf einer Frontbreite von 2400 Kilometern vollzieht sich der größte Aufmarsch, den die Geschichte bisher gesehen hat. Die besten Soldaten der Welt sind zum Schutze der Kultur gegen die Barbarei angetreten. In the German newsreels, the invasion looks like a walk in the park. Not a single angry Russian in sight. The Colossus with clay feet, that was the portrayal of the Soviet Union. That there is nothing there. There is no organization, there is no hierarchy, there is no plan. This is what Bolshevism had, has done to the Soviet Union. In those first two weeks, 300,000 Russian soldiers are taken prisoner. It's all going so well for Hitler, he can't resist the perfect photo op, hanging out with the troops at the front. Meanwhile, back in Moscow, it's time for the counterattack. First thing Stalin does, control the message. No more talk of bad news. <laughs> If we had shown even just a little of what was happening in reality, people would have lost their morale. They would have stopped fighting. Next, Stalin has a go at motivational speaking. Stalin was not charismatic before the war, but once the war started, it gave him a kind of charisma for the people. He is now the generalissimo. From then on, he has this charismatic personality. Appeals to Communist Party pride aren't working, so Stalin tries a new tack, nationalism. Bring back heroes from the time of the Russian Tsars. Heroes the communists tried so hard to eradicate. In the 1930s, a certain kind of film was very popular in Russia. Historical dramas. Real tearjerkers. One of Stalin's all-time faves was a film called Shapayev. One of the main characters is Anka. Anka. Pamiraju. Patronata. Young women flock to theaters to see her. Anka fights for the revolution, machine gun in hand. A real inspiration 
for Lyudmila Pavlichenko. I think all women who volunteered in 1941 were inspired by this movie, and Lyudmila must have seen it more than once. In the 1930s, for a female to kill a man, it's a shocking image. Now, in real life, Lyudmila actually was picking off Germans, one by one, and she was now up to hundreds of kills. But there was something else she was really good at, telling her own story. So she created an image that a female sniper is possible not only as a student before 1941, but a reality of World War II, the reality of mechanized warfare. Ludmilla is Stalin's dream girl. She's a killer, she's educated, and she can write. So he gets her to write for a propaganda magazine. This story is guaranteed to whip up national fervor. Hatred is a great teacher. It has taught me how to kill the enemy. Hatred has sharpened my vision. It has made me cunning and shrewd. Hatred has taught me how to camouflage, how to fool the enemy, and how to figure out his tricks. Lyudmila was very explicitly suggesting that young women also can be combatants. So in a sense, she was articulating things that the Stalinist leadership could never articulate directly, that it was running mobilization specifically for women. Stalin is so pleased with Ludmilla's morale-boosting skills that he sends her to the U.S. and Canada to drum up support for the Russian cause. But Stalin needs more than heroes. He'll put anyone with a name to work. Poets, authors, musicians, all are given the job of rousing the masses. Leningrad is famous for its artists, none more so than Dmitry Shostakovich, one of Russia's most celebrated composers. Right now, Leningrad is under siege. Hitler's armies have blocked all access to the city. For 872 days, Leningrad is cut off from the world it will be the longest and most horrific siege in history. So many are cut down by German artillery, die of sickness, or starvation. The death toll is in the hundreds of thousands. To inspire the people of the city, Shostakovich writes a brilliant piece of music. It will become the Leningrad Symphony. two parts of a large symphony. Why do I announce this? So that radio listeners will know that life in our city goes on as normal. But life in Leningrad is anything but normal. It's more like hell on earth. The bombardment is endless. Despite the hardship and suffering, Jostakovich's symphony is played both here and around the world as a symbol of Russian defiance. So while Hitler is laying siege to Leningrad and starving its citizens, and his army is marching on Moscow, it seems like nothing can stop him. Well, except for one thing. And it's the one thing nobody can control the weather. Hitler has waited too long. He underestimated the Russian people and the Russian winter. Stalin's Russia will rise and gain strength, fueled by propaganda of love your country and hate the Germans. Hitler's misjudgment would come back to haunt him.
Canada had been at war since 1939, joining forces with Britain and France against Germany. At the beginning, the Canadian Army was only 8,000 strong. In a few short months, tens of thousands enlist as the build-up begins. Canadian women also want to play an active role, so they lobby politicians to allow them into the services. It takes until 1941 for the government to create the women's forces. More than 45,000 will serve, some of them overseas, though they are never sent to the front. On the home front, the big question is, who will work in the war factories? The obvious answer, recruit women. But to get women into factories, they needed just the right role model. So the National Film Board went looking for someone to feature in their publicity campaign, and they found her at the Inglis factory in Toronto. Her job is assembling Bren guns. Her name, Veronica Foster. Nice, but the NFB wants a more catchy name, and she becomes Ronnie the Bren Gun Girl. Part of it is to create an acceptance, both in the, in the general public, but also the men who are still working in those factories. So why not have this beautiful model-esque woman uh, stand in for the whole of the women's workforce at the time? Meanwhile, in the machine shop, a thousand pairs of hands are building war power. War power from college graduate Betty Pearson, working with Jesse Adams, who thought of being an interior decorator. The images of Veronica and the other women highlight their femininity even though they're doing so-called men's work. The government is sending out a clear message. Women were expected to fill these roles for the duration of the war, and the government had a lot of propaganda campaigns that tried to legitimate this by assuring the public that these were temporary positions and that women were still feminine after all. They even tell women how to behave outside the factory. These images show women like Ronnie after work, having fun, behaving as a woman should behave. They were still above all expected to be feminine and also expected to want to get married and to catch a husband. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men. Some jobs better. They discover that factory work is usually no more difficult than housework. Veronica Foster's family is the perfect model for the NFB. They're hardworking and patriotic. While Veronica works at the factory, her three brothers have gone to fight the war. This photo series portrays other women, like the Perry sisters from Quebec. They work at Dominion Arsenals. These pictures are widely used in magazines and newspapers. When it comes to winning over the Canadian public, the NFB hits on a great idea. They commission cartoons from Walt Disney. Don't let that sap tell you how to spend your money. Be smart. Spend it on yourself. Okay, I will. Wait, everyone must do his share. The cartoons are an instant hit. The animated shorts were distributed through an arrangement with over almost 800 theaters nationwide showing these shorts before feature film presentations. Well-known Disney characters are shown mocking the Nazis, but the three little pigs steal the show. They're essentially recycling existing animated material. They simply added a swastika to the Big Bad Wolves and replaced the bricks of the third pig's homestead with Canadian war bonds. These bricks not only stop his blowing, they will also get him going. 
The NFB scores another propaganda coup with Churchill's Island, narrated by Lorne Green. The documentary shows how the British are defending themselves against Hitler. In the marches of East Anglia, with every passing hour, this island fortress of Churchill and his people grows more formidable. The film is a box office success and wins the NFB its first Oscar. Anyone who saw the films recognized not just the rhetorical power of these shorts, but also the accomplishment of the NFB, which was still very, very young at this time. But the star of the show, the poster girl for Canada's entire propaganda campaign is Ronnie the Bren Gun Girl. She later becomes a singer and pursues a career as a model. In the following months, she would have an American cousin. To drum up support for its war effort, the American propaganda machine would create Rosie the Riveter. December 6th, 1941, Saturday afternoon in Hawaii. A few hundred kilometers offshore, a Japanese armada is waiting, ready to take the Americans by surprise. Its mission, destroy the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. At the same time, below the surface, five miniature submarines are attempting to get inside the harbor. These are the latest secret weapons of the Japanese Navy. Their mission, sink as many US ships as possible without being detected. Each sub has a two-man crew. All 10 are about to fulfill their dream to commit the ultimate sacrifice for their country. Among them, Kazuo Sakamaki. I said to myself, I have come all this way and success is within sight. How can I quit and return after so many years of preparation and training for this mission? Why would they be sent on this mission at all? And why would a small country like Japan want to attack such a huge country like America? After all, until now, the Americans were safely on the sidelines. It all started in 1937. After invading China and taking Nanking, Japan continued its advance and now occupies much of North and coastal China. American President Roosevelt retaliates by cutting off all oil exports to Japan. Of course, the Japanese military machine runs on American oil, so they consider the embargo a declaration of war the Japanese propaganda machine shifts into high gear. Well, Japanese media at the time described British and Americans as a greedy imperialist, which were exploiting many Asian nations and gathering all the fortunes from all parts of the world. So to lead Japan into this great adventure of liberating Asia from the oppressor, a new prime minister is named. General Hideki Tojo, a hardliner. Tojo gives a voice to the discontented, to want to fulfill the dream of a Japanese empire. <laughs> Japanese propaganda echoes his message. Get rid of these foreign imperialists. Finally, it's okay to scream at the top of your lungs, kill all these American bastards. Get them all. Wipe them off the face of the earth because it's going to be a better world once these people are gone. Sakamaki, a young naval officer, shares this dream of a Japanese empire free of these foreigners. He was born in a small village on the island of Skikoku. His father named him Kazuo, meaning peace boy. But at the Naval Academy, 
he had learned to obey orders. I was like a young warrior facing battle for the first time. If I thought about death, it did not frighten me at all. In fact, I smiled like a hero about to subdue a superior adversary. If I should fail, no, I could not fail. We were supposed to feel highly honored. With death, I would accomplish my objective. Any expression of individuality was crushed, brutally crushed, driven out of these men. They were to have only one thought, and that was the thought of absolute obedience to authority. For these 10 young men, there's no going back. They are expected to sacrifice themselves for the country and the empire. On the night of December 6th, they get in their subs to begin their mission. Early next morning, without warning, the Imperial fleet unleashes all of its might on Pearl Harbor. Wave after wave of bombers launched from aircraft carriers attacked the naval base. The Americans are taken by total surprise. Gap planes without warning bring war to America. Our great Pacific outpost in the Hawaiian Islands is ruthlessly bombed. As Japan's perfidious declaration of war. The U.S. Pacific Fleet suffers heavy losses. Nine ships are sunk, 21 severely damaged. 2,350 people die in the attack. Americans are in a state of shock. The next day, the United States declares war on Japan. The attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. And what about those 10 men in those mini-subs? For Sakamaki and his fellow submariners, the attack was a failure. To this day, no one knows if any of them even managed to hit a target. We do know four of the subs were destroyed, the fifth, Sakamaki's, washed up on the shore. Sakamaki wakes up on the beach to find his fellow crewman dead. Now, you'd think he'd be happy to be alive. In fact, he's devastated. Sakamaki endures the ultimate humiliation. He has just become the first Japanese prisoner of war. I was possessed by a terrible, uncontrollable shame. I trembled with the fear that, because of me, the invaluable secret weapon had fallen into the enemy's hands. The only thing left for me was to plan what to do with myself. Live or die, that was the question. When he realizes his photograph will be taken, Sakamaki uses a burning cigarette to deliberately disfigure his face. Who knows what's behind the forced smile? The Japanese military had a very clear no-surrender policy. It was the law. You absolutely would not be captured alive. The nine submariners who died are declared heroes, promoted in rank, and honored with extravagant funerals. Their last wishes, written down before their mission, are published in magazines. The nine young men who did die in the midget submarines became warrior gods. They were the rock stars of wartime Japan. They were celebrities. But someone is missing, Kazuo Sakamaki. His name disappears. His existence 
no longer acknowledged. The Japanese would draw on the cult of the nine warrior gods. They would worship them, make movies about them, to inspire the nation to continue the victorious advance in the Pacific. Sakamaki's mini submarine gets recycled, this time as a weapon for American propaganda. The flashback to Pearl Harbor and the Jap two-man submarine captured at Hawaii. The vessel is shipped to the west coast, hoisted onto a trailer, and paraded across the U.S. to help sell war bonds. Have now made a close study of these suicide craft. Fear of a Japanese invasion of North America draws the crowds. People want to see the new secret weapon. Before this war is over, there'll be many more new secret weapons created.